Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, as always, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium. Please, uh, more importantly, uh, fill out uh, the program evaluation to give us any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jay Brown, allergist extraordinaire and staunch advocate uh, for CME, uh, and actually a member of the CME committee. Uh, it's always been my contention that Dr. Brown provides us with more CME in one hour than most presenters do in two. And we're, we're really pleased that he uh, was able to accept our invitation today to uh, shower us with some allergy pearls. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jay Brown. Thanks, Steve. Oh, am I on? Can you all hear me? Are we good? Yes. So what a nice introduction. Thank you, Steve. I am on the committee, and it took about three requests uh, uh, for me to agree to do this. It takes about three years for me to forget how much I hate preparing for grand rounds uh, before I own it and do it. Uh, so I'm going to start with a picture. Maybe I won't. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is George and Polly. Uh, George on the left. There won't be a quiz on, at the end. Uh, I am not a theologian. I am utterly persuaded there is a God with a mean sense of humor because I'm an allergist with an insane cat allergy. And uh, so uh, when uh, I uh, uh, fell in love with my lovely psychiatrist wife, uh, wouldn't you know, she came with cats. And so uh, anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm walking the walk. I'm an asthmatic with allergies and uh, and oh, I'm, I'm pointing lasers at people in the audience. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, OK, I've figured out how to use the technology. Uh, we're going to talk about a hodgepodge of things. And forgive me for this. I'm all over the place, I'm gonna, which is kind of my nature. Uh, talk about allergic pathophysiology very briefly. And then antihistamines, just a few quick thoughts on that. Uh, the asthma guidelines, again, real brief discussion of them. And then biologics is probably where we'll spend most of our time. But I have a few uh, bees in my bonnet. And I thought I would share with you some thoughts on beta agonists and uh, penicillin testing. So. Uh, to start with, uh, the allergic reaction. So uh, which one of these things points a laser? This is a mast cell. This is what put my children through college and pays for my house. And uh, the IgE antibody is affixed to the surface of the mast cell. It's the only antibody that actually starts off bound to its effector cell before anything happens. And the reason for that has to do with time. Uh, these mast cells are in your body, near as we understand it, to help fight worms. And when you're assaulted by a worm, uh, you need to respond quickly. These little buggers will climb past your skin and into your retroperitoneal space or lungs or whatever it is they're aiming at and get there pretty quick. And you don't have like the several days it might take you to mount a response to a viral infection. Several days after the exposure, you're kind of screwed. So it's important to dig in and make stuff happen. Um, the uh, uh, mast cell, when activated, activates because these antigens will cross-link the Ig antibodies. And that, in turn, leads to degranulation of the mast cell. And it spits out all this junk, uh, antihistamines, and other chemicals that are designed to make a parasite miserable. And if you're me, allergic to George and Polly, make me miserable with the drippy, sneezy, itchy symptoms of allergies and the wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath of asthma. So that was the whole uh, overview of the allergic response. Uh, anybody uh, recognize these two people? Anybody? Movie? Anybody know what movie that is? Yell it out. Hitch, and that's, of course, Will Smith. And I thought that was somebody else. That's uh, Eva Mendez. And uh, do you see what he's sucking down there? You guys know what, uh, what, what he's consuming here, what that is? That is Benadryl. Um, not a bad choice for a severe allergic reaction, uh, but not a great choice for long-term use. The first generation uh, antihistamines are quick acting, and they are effective. It's not an efficacy problem. It's a make you stupid problem. And so they will dry you out and make you stupid. And uh, they have a pretty significant anticholinergic effect. But again, they work pretty well. We much prefer the second generation drugs. I used to joke when I gave talks years ago, back when giving a talk for the uh, evil industry people was not considered so unwholesome that, uh, you know, like you couldn't do that and still be righteous. I gave it up 20 years ago, but uh, I had a great joke I can't tell anymore because I don't give this talk. Well, I got to tell it today. And it's not funny anymore because these second generation drugs, Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, they've all become very inexpensive. But my joke was we had two kinds of antihistamines the ones that made you stupid and the ones that made you poor. And so use the ones that 
used to make you poor, no longer make you poor. Zyrtec is by far my favorite of those because it works well. They're supposed to last 24 hours. That's a little bit of a reach, but close. And they're either non-sedating. Allegra and Claritin should not make you at all sleepy. Uh, the Zyrtec will make like a 5% of people sleepy. And uh, it's worth it to most people to just take it at bedtime. If they wake up still sleepy, well, then I talk about other options, which would include Allegra uh, or Zizol. Now, don't use Zizol unless you're one of those odd ducks who was sleepy on Zyrtec. The reason being, Zizol is expensive. It's a buck and a half a tablet, give or take. And it's the uh, left-handed isomer of Zyrtec. So when you take Zyrtec, for like two cents a tablet, you're getting a buck and a half of Zizol built in. And the problem is the right-handed isomer of Zyrtec is the one that causes most of the sedation. You cut the sedation rate roughly in half by using Zizol. And some of the people say, boy, I love that Zyrtec. It works really well, but I'm a zombie all day. Well, use Zizol or Allegra, which is a lot more effective than Claritin. So enough on that. Uh, they're all available over the counter. And you know, you can pay about um, $7 for five tablets of Zyrtec at the gas station on 13th before the interstate, and yet at Sam's Club, Costco, and Amazon, they will sell you 350 of the tablets or 370, 365 of them for like 15 bucks. Do that. Uh, and uh, that's it for antihistamines. Now, a quick overview of the guidelines. Uh, these guidelines are getting stale. This is 2007, the NIH last published their guidelines. There's an outfit uh, that publishes updated guidelines. GINA is what we call these things, and that's been a bit of a mystery to me because it's the Global Initiative for Asthma, and that doesn't spell GINA. I guess it rolls off the tongue better than GIA, but whatever. Um, so, you know, most people with a little bit of asthma, they use an albuterol inhaler here and there. That's all they need if they need the albuterol less than a time or two a week, or less than three times a week. So if you use your albuterol uh, every day before exercise, that's free. But if you need it for symptom relief more than twice a week, that is not good enough, and we're supposed to do more. And the more that we do, typically would be a low dose of an inhaled steroid. There's uh, uh, the option of using Singular, which is a wimpy drug, quite awesome in the toddlers, but I would use uh, an inhaled steroid at a low dose. Or if you're real close to the edge, maybe you need it three times a week, your albuterol, I might use Singular uh, and hope for the best. Singular dovetails very nicely with the Zyrtec. So I typically, if I'm using Singular, which is Montelukast, the generic name, oops, should have said that instead of Singular. But if you're using a generic, and it is available as generic, uh, I always add Zyrtec to it because it just turbocharges the stuff. So for people who have more trouble, this isn't enough. They're still either twice, more than twice a week on their day-to-day -day need for albuterol, or they're more than uh, uh, once or twice a month waking up with asthma. That's a no-no. Or they have gummed up lung functions. Well, then I really like adding a LABA, which is short for long-acting bronchodilator. These are drugs like Cerevent or Fomoterol, uh, Salmeterol, uh, Fomoterol. That's the other component uh, in the combination inhalers, uh, Advair, Dulera, Symbicort, Brio, and Air Duo, which nobody uses, which is ironic because it's like a fourth the price of the rest of them, but they're not on formularies as a rule. So a shout out to Air Duo, which is actually the only one of all of my inhalers available as a generic, which is a shocking factoid uh, in and of itself. So if that doesn't work, well, then we're jacking up the steroid. We're thinking about adding the leukotriene inhibitor if we haven't already. We're thinking uh, about adding a LAMA. Uh, it sounds like some exotic... Uh, uh, you know, South American beast. It's not. It's a long-acting muscarinic inhaler, and we'll talk more about those in a minute, but uh, there are a bunch of them. The only one approved for asthma is um, Spireva. Uh, uh, teotropium. Uh, I should have said Teotropium, also known as brand name Spireva. So, when that doesn't work, and you still have not met these criteria of decent-looking numbers, which incidentally, as was supposed to be reversible, you will never get some asthmatics to have normalized lung function. So, you know, you kind of give that up. But you should be able to get people to the point where they don't have asthma symptoms, but a time or two a week, and asthma symptoms that respond promptly to albuterol. So, uh, if if we're at stage five, step five, now we're talking about adding maybe a macrolide. That's kind of a new thing that's freaking me out a little bit because we all know we want to dial down the antibiotic use, but that actually is not a bad choice. Uh, and uh, oral steroids, which is a terrible idea, 
this slide doesn't really do justice to the real GINA guidelines, but this one was so busy, I decided to save it for a second. You can barely make this out, trust me on this. It's the biologics, and we're going to talk about the biologic agents. These are insanely expensive drugs that you inject in some form or another, either subcutaneously or in an infusion, and they will do good things for asthma. And I also like this slide, even though it's so busy, because this slide, whoops, back. Am I clever enough to go back? Yes, I am. Yay. Um, this continuous uh, reassessment is an important part of asthma management. Asthma is a moving target. And just because you got the guy feeling pretty good now and you're his hero or her hero, you know, that doesn't mean that it's going to stay that way. And so the people who trained me at Northwestern in Chicago were oppressive with follow-up visits. Oh, my Lord, they had people coming back every week sometimes. And it was like, you know, we're going to beat you into compliance with follow-up visits until you do exactly what we tell you and things are going better. But to see an asthmatic on stage three or four or five therapy every six months is kind of a no-brainer. And that doesn't always make sense to the patient. You know, like, boy, I just saw you six months ago. I'm still fine. But that's that, I think, is a bare minimum for the people with more significant disease. My mild intermittent asthmatics, these people I'll see once a year. And these people usually a couple times a year. If people really suck, I'll bring them back um, uh, every, uh, well, as often as I need to to get them in line. Uh, I hope sucks is okay. My mother scolded me for using that word. Uh, my children, in a, in a very unique experience, uh, came to my defense. They're like, no, Grandma, Jojo, that is not a naughty word. So forgive me if it's naughty to you. Um, so that's that. Uh, any questions on the GINA guidelines at this point? Are we good to go on the next subject? Because we're about to talk about biologics, and this gets a little messy. So this is uh, a much cooler slide than it looks like. Uh, this is a lymphocyte waiting to decide what it wants to be when it grows up. And this is a profoundly interesting thing, if you ask me. Your lymphocytes get to decide, based in part on the uh, innate immune response to an antigen, what kind of a response it's going to mount. And in broad strokes, and this is an oversimplification, but any discussion of immunology will seem like a grotesque oversimplification to doctors 10 years from now. I mean, it's just the nature of immunology. But this cell gets to decide to either do kind of a cytolytic immune response, which is great if you're fighting a viral infection and the enemy is inside of cells, or decide if it wants to make an antibody-driven response, which is great if you're fighting, for example, a parasite. So in very broad strokes, Th1 antiviral, Th2 uh, extracellular enemy, right? So there are a lot of diseases where your immune system can go one way or another, and it's not like, you know, one is always right and the other one's always wrong. If you have leprosy, and oh my gosh, uh, I think that's best. So, you know, there are two forms of leprosy. One of them is, 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 is not a big deal, and I think that's the, uh, the antibody-driven response, and the cell-mediated response is a bad one. And so too, like, some people get Lyme disease, ain't no thing, and others, you know, their joints are all angry and their heart is deteriorating and bad things are happening because their immune system made a wrong choice. But what this has to do with me and asthma is that this TH2 response is the one that you would appropriately want to make, or, or the appropriate response for an extracellular pathogen. It's also the response your body makes if you're allergic. So for most of us seeing cat dander, your immune system doesn't go, oh no, it's a parasite. But for those of us who are allergic, we make this antibody-driven response, which causes a lot of trouble. So once you're doing that, your body will call into play uh, the mast cell and the eosinophil, and of course, B cells that make these antibodies. And the mast cell is the brains of the operation. That is the cell that has a giant nucleus, and it does all sorts of synthetic stuff. And in fact, that gives rise to these biphasic responses. So I'm at a you know, before I lived with cats, uh, I'd be at a cocktail party, be all drippy, sneezy, itchy, and stuffy. I'd go home, I'd feel better, and then I'd wake up at 2 in the morning with asthma symptoms. That was because of all the junk these mast cells were synthesizing. You know, this, 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 this preformed mediator thing get miserable, and then it quiets down, and then this so-called delayed reaction or, or secondary response. Uh, and uh, so the mast cells do that. This is the most 
poisonous cell, arguably, in the human body. There is, they say, no more toxic substance made by your body uh, than the eosinophilic cationic protein, which is like uh, a, a wicked chemical. And uh, so eosinophils are great if you're trying to fight, arguably, our most sophisticated enemies, the multicellular uh, parasites. Not so great if your body's responding to cat dander. And... Uh, we can block a lot of these things with these so-called biologic agents, and that's what I'm about to uh, confuse you with. So uh, this is uh, uh, omalizumab. Notice how I use the generic name first, brand name Zolair. This thing came out about a decade ago, give or take, and this is an antibody directed against IgE. So this thing will bind to IgE, and... Uh, it's a pretty slick trick. Uh, it comes with problems, more on that. So the, uh, the omalizumab, or Zolaire, uh, is a humanized uh, monoclonal antibody, and it is directed against the IgE. It is approved for the youngsters, so this makes it unique. It's the only one I got I can give to a six-year-old. And it uh, uh, will help asthma. It's approved by the FDA for moderate or persistent asthma. And uh, it's uh, an injection, and it uh, requires that you have an IgE level. Now, in this country, uh, we need a level between 30 and 700. Now, a 30 level is not going to get me very excited about using this stuff. I'd like to see a triple-digit IgE antibody level. And frankly, people with allergies, you know, I just saw somebody today who had an IgE level of 3,500. And you can get that with bad allergic disease like eczema, not evil allergic disease, just annoying allergic disease and so don't be too freaked out if those IgE levels are high but if your IgE level is is that high uh, your insurance company is not going to pay for Zolaire because you'd need a ton of it uh, the amount of Zolaire we give you is very much a function of how high is the level if it's real high it's off the table in Europe they'll dose people with the Zolaire stuff even up to 1500 but not here so I've got dosing tables that will put you to sleep uh, and I'll show you those in a moment. Um, this is a drug which also requires some demonstrable specific allergy immune response. So we either need skin tests or in vitro testing like uh, ELISA IgE levels to cat, dog, mold, dust, pollen, what have you. This actually is also good at muffling food reactions. That's been clearly demonstrated. So it actually makes allergy shots a little safer. So if somebody's going to have a reaction to an allergy shot, they're less apt to have a reaction to an allergy shot if you've got Zolar in them. And some people are so sensitive that uh, we will use uh, this stuff because we couldn't get allergy shots into them. That's where you inject them with a cat, dog, dander, what have you. Uh, it, you know, they, they have bad reactions, and you can muffle that with the Zolaire. Uh, for the GETA guidelines, this is a level 5 drug, and you need an eosinophil count if the eosinophil count is like zero or immeasurably low, this is probably not going to be as effective. And uh, you can see the stuff works pretty good. You can reduce after a year uh, the uh, relative risk of an exacerbation by, you know, 43%. That's pretty strong. Uh, so that you got to like that. Uh, this is a, a, a slide I made myself stealing data out of the literature on how it's a function of your eosinophil count. So you, you can see if your eosinophil count is really not very high, it's not as effective as if your eosinophil count is higher. So that is going to be a recurring theme as we talk about these drugs. Higher eosinophil counts, better efficacy with all five. Yes, I'm going to bore you with all five biologic agents. It's not my fault. Uh, so uh, it's important to know the downside of this stuff. Uh, so first and foremost, I don't know if I put it up here, Cost. This stuff is crazy expensive. We're talking like, and I'm totally making up numbers, it so depends on people's insurance, and that's what we care about. We actually, oddly, have not had that much trouble whizzing these drugs past the insurance companies. They will pay for this stuff if it's indicated. Local injections, that's not really a big deal. Anaphylaxis, that is really a big deal. So it's kind of ironic because I just got done telling you that there's less anaphylaxis to an allergy shot if you've got Zoller. There's less anaphylaxis to a food allergen if you've got Zoller, even though that's not actually an official indication. Uh, there is anaphylaxis caused by Zoller. So the number that we had been quoting people is something in the neighborhood of about 
four and a thousand point four percent, but it may be lower than that. Uh, and this is the bad news. You got to wait two hours after the first three shots and a half an hour after all subsequent injections. So it's a pain in the behind. We usually will make sure people have an EpiPen with that stuff. And uh, like I say, stupid expensive. Here's the black box warning. I won't make you read that. But, you know, you don't want people dying of anaphylaxis. And people have died of anaphylaxis from this stuff. So it's really important. We canceled a Zoller injection on somebody in Marshalltown the other day because they just didn't have time to wait around. And it was going to be their first shot, and they needed to wait around. So the dose is subcutaneous every four, two to four weeks. And uh, it's based on a number of factors, based on weight, age, and total IgE. So you all got that already, the, the slide you've done with this. Um, so it's ugly. You can see there's a cutoff. If people, you know, you take a 70 kilogram guy, where are you? There's my 70 kilogram guy. His IgE level's above 375. You're not using Zolair. The insurance company is gonna pay for it. So that was really convenient for them. Again, in Europe, they might. You patients go to Europe if they want. But that's the adult dosing chart. This is the kitty dosing chart. And uh, the um, other thing I wanted to mention about Zolaire is that we use that sucker also uh, for hives. And it's pretty effective. And Ed, who knows everything, it's scary to ask Ed a question. I challenge those of you outside of our specialty to just float him a question on radiology or on nephrology and just see how he does. It's just, it's deeply disturbing to me. But, uh, uh, and why was I touting Ed? Well, he's a really brilliant guy. Oh yeah, he was at a meeting and, and there are, he knows the people who write guidelines and allegedly the next guidelines on managing chronic idiopathic urticaria, which is a big part of our business. These are mystery hives. People show up, they're covered with hives, they're miserable, they're desperate. After a bunch of antihistamines, he says the new hive guidelines, they don't, we don't have guidelines, the first First hive guidelines, uh, official guidelines, will say they flunked all of their, their antihistamines, now you're going to put them on Zolaire. So historically, the insurance companies have uh, required that you know, we try even, uh, even immunosuppressive drugs, uh, you know, prednisone and cyclosporin before we're allowed to use Zolaire. And they're, they are pretty liberal with this. They'll let us get away with these drugs. So it, this is not dosed on IgE levels. Don't bother with an IgE level. And you have choices of doses. It's 150 a, a month or uh, 300 milligrams a month. And you can see uh, the sucker works. I mean, this is the sort of misery in, in, uh, index here. And the stuff has been quite effective in most patients who are miserable with hives. So not the first line agent, obviously, at 15 grand a, a, a year, but uh, it is certainly a consideration. So that's my rant on Zolaire. Uh, then uh, we have other biologics. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is Mepiluzumab. Nucala is the brand name. And this thing binds interleukin-5. So interleukin-5 is the lifeblood of eosinophils. It helps them differentiate into eosinophils. It prolongs their life expectancy. And it makes your body make more of them. So when you give people uh, these interleukin-5 binding antibodies, uh, you'll see their eosinophil count drop almost to a person. So uh, what's the ups and downs of that sucker? Uh, Nucala is, uh, come on, there we go, humanized IG-1 IL-5 antibody, and it's approved for 12 and up, and make note of that because its competitor is approved for uh, another anti-IL-5 antibody is approved for uh, 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 18 and, or 17, or I should say 18 and up. Um, this is again a, a stage 5 asthma drug, and uh, there is no official eosinophil count for prescribing it, but it's very much uh, a function. Its utility is very much going to be dependent on how bad is the eosinophilia that goes with your asthma. It's kind of interesting. Asthma in the uh, 1970s and 80s was described in England as eosinophilic bronchitis. I mean, it was like the defining cell of asthma to the English. And it's it's kind of complicated, but it's not quite as mission critical to asthma as I would have thought. I thought when these drugs were coming out, it'd be like the death of asthma. And it's, it's helpful, but it's not magic helpful for most patients. So the National Institute of Health uh, and Care Excellence, they suggest 300 or better. Uh, and uh, you seem to need to be at least 150. And I've got a slide on that in a moment. Uh, 
in a moment. I have a slide on that. Uh, side effects. So this stuff is remarkably well tolerated. Uh, I've been using this, oddly. This just got approved about a year and a half, two years ago, I think. Uh, time flies. The older I get, uh, the, the more off my estimations of how much time has elapsed. But I started using this stuff on a patient referred to me by Dr. Ottoman. I don't think Larry's here. But there's this kid who had eosinophils in his esophagus. And uh, he had been to the mountaintop. He was on an elemental diet. He had this funky thing called eosinophilic esophagitis, and this drug totally changed this guy's life. I mean, he'd been on huge doses of prednisone. He was on these funky diets without food. An elemental diet is where we give that to babies who are allergic to everything. This is like not protein. This is amino acids, right? So it's horrible tasting. And he went two months on that porridge, and it was just hideous. Uh, so again, real well tolerated. You can be allergic to it. I haven't seen it. There is some question. I suspect this is a statistical fluke thing where in early trials, there was a little more shingles in people who had been on this. And so I try to remember to get the people their, their new Shingarex shot, which is an awesome vaccine. So uh, everybody should have one of those uh, if they're over the age of 50. Um, we see local reactions. I haven't had anybody complaining to me about that. But at any rate, I, I, I had a drug rep from GSK who makes this stuff in my office bringing samples. And I'm like, I've got this guy who I think would really benefit from your, uh, your mepiluzumab. Is there any way I could get it? And he's like, I don't know. And he bounces it up to the home office in London. And, you know, months later, he came back to me like, yeah, you can be a compassionate use investigator. And it took really only my asking that I have the stuff. And it's odd, but I'm still a compassionate use investigator in GSK's eyes. I've got two people from Kansas City who drive to Ames, Iowa to get this in infusion, this is not the way it's administered in the form of Mucala. That's a subcutaneous injection. I'll explain in a minute. But these people get the IV version. And I've got two people driving from Kansas City to come see me. It's weird. I'm on the phone with allergists in Kansas City trying to get them to do what I did. So it's ridiculous how these people drive three hours to come see me. So it's 100 milligrams a month. And that's convenient because there's not much trouble remembering. The dose is the same for everybody. It's not based on weight. Uh, and it's a subcutaneous injection, which is kind of handy. So <clears throat> here is uh, the efficacy data. So it improves quality of life. All these five drugs do. I did kind of a fun thing this morning. I cornered Wheeler and Nassif and said, OK, we've got <coughs> excuse me, five of these the cats, five of these things. Which one do you think works the best? And I got. Uh, a bunch of and, and that's not like Ed. Uh, you know, Ed is a guy who calls him as he sees him and doesn't have any trouble sticking his neck out. And I couldn't really squeeze the guy for an answer. And, and Dr. Wheeler, God bless him, he wasn't quite ready to say, yeah, of the five, I like X. Uh, but I would tell you, of the five, not based on any head-to-head -head comparisons, because I think I'll grow old and die before anybody ever does a head-to-head -head comparison. What's wrong with this country? But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I think this may be my most effective of the five. I'm going to tell you about that's a total seat of the pants best guess, so don't hold me to it. Uh, it's unsettling that this thing will, uh, this, this talk I'm giving will live in infamy. And, you know, five years from now, people are like, oh, you idiot. It wasn't that one. It was another one, but whatever. So it, there are studies showing an improvement in your FEV1, the amount of area blowout in a second, which is an important parameter in measuring asthma. It definitely reduces the steroid burden in people who are requiring oral steroids. Uh, it reduces the exacerbation rate by about half. So we have the Mensa study, the DREAM study, and uh, uh, the duration, like, okay, we're going to spend, you know, whatever, 25 grand a year. I made the number up. Don't hold me to that. Uh, again, pretty well covered for our patients, I would say. But uh, like, okay, we're going to do this crazy expensive thing. How long are we going to do that? Well, you know, it's not a cure. And you stop the drug, and it seems like whatever benefit you derived is not going to be sustained. Uh, so that's all fuzzy. Here's the exacerbation slide. And you can see a rather striking improvement in that. So moving on to its cousin drug, which you don't need to spend much time learning about because I haven't encountered a formulary for which it's preferred. And it's not as convenient. Uh, the people that sell uh, Reslizumab, which is Syncare, I think it's Teva Pharmaceuticals, uh, they came up with a product that is dosed based on weight, and it's infused. And that's going to be a big problem for them in a the marketplace. It's only approved for 18 and up. And uh, it's, again, stage 5 asthma, pretty bad asthma. 
plasma. No said eosinophil count, but as with all the rest of them, you better have eosinophils in your peripheral smear or it's probably not going to work. Uh, now, I should mention, too, if you've got somebody with such wicked asthma, they're on prednisone, well, you need to send them to me or to Ed or John or to me. Somebody needs to help you take care of that patient on oral steroids chronically. But uh, they will kill eosinophils. So knowing that your eosinophil count is in the toilet, it's really low, which is good generally, but you're on oral steroids, that's cheating. So if you're measuring CBCs, like after a few days of prednisone, that's not the CBC you want to be looking at. So just throwing that out there. Uh, I would tell you, uh, sink air is uh, pretty well tolerated, but big asterisk. It also causes anaphylaxis. It's not very common, but arguably more common than the Zoller, which has a black black box warning, and uh, it doesn't happen in a, oh, it, I'm sorry, it does have, this also has a black box warning, my bad, uh, and you got to wait, the FDA doesn't tell us how long you have to wait, but you have to wait, I don't know, uh, I haven't ever used this stuff, so I won't tell you how long uh, uh, you're supposed to, I'd probably guess an hour for my taste, because I'm somewhat risk averse, but here's what's weird, is you can anaphylax from this thing quite some time down the road. And the dosing, again, it's three milligrams per kilogram. It's IV. Patients don't love that. And uh, you got to do it in the op office, obviously. And it takes, you know, close to an hour to infuse this stuff. So uh, it works. Uh, the uh, uh, outcomes are very similar to what we see with the uh, mepiluzumab and, for that matter, the Zoller and the uh, uh, dipl dipilumab, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. 50% reduction in, in exacerbations. Uh, again, studies done in people with pretty high eosinophil counts, which is cheating, because the more the eosinophil count, the easier it is to demonstrate efficacy. And uh, it does seem to have an impact on FEV1. So moving on, uh, we are going to talk now about benralizumab. Remember, we just talked about resulizumab. And I don't know what the FDA was thinking, giving these things almost identical names, benralizumab versus resulizumab. But this one is different. This is Fisenra. And it is uh, uh, not targeting interleukin-5 exactly. It is targeting the receptor for interleukin-5. And uh, so it has much the same effect. Uh, and so more on that. Humanized IL-5 uh, receptor antibody. It blocks IL-5, but it's also going to kill the cells, some of them, that are uh, holding those IL-5 receptors, which theoretically could give it an edge. This is approved, like the Nucala, unlike the Sync Air, for kids uh, 12 and up. And so uh, maintenance treatment, stage five, that's a recurring theme. No set eosinophil count, but very much a function of how high are your peripheral eosinophils. So uh, again, less eosinophil count is required for me to get excited about this if somebody's on oral steroids. Uh, so side effects, is that what's next? Yes. Um, anaphylaxis in 3%. It's, uh, I'm sorry, I lied about, you, know, you can see how confusing this is. I lied about the resulizumab, it's benresulizumab that has this delayed anaphylaxis thing, so that's weird. It didn't get a black box warning, and uh, it doesn't tell you how long to make people wait. We usually make them wait a half an hour, uh, and if they do react, you're all done with it, and that probably is a fair statement for all of them. Uh, pharyngitis and headache, but again, I, I'm left to wonder if that's even really a thing. Haven't seen people have problems like that. I have an N of 1 experience where a guy who was on the Nucala uh, 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 Mepiluzumab stuff got switched for insurance company reasons to the uh, Fisenra slash Benralizumab, and he's like, I don't like this as much. I'm getting crappy at the end of the dosing interval, which is two months after the first three shots. So uh, dosing is... Uh, uh, every month for three doses and then every other month. Now, I'll give you that that's more convenient, but I'll also tell you it ain't cheaper. So the retail on these things, which nobody ever pays, is probably about the same. So you can't do it at home. This is something that can cause anaphylaxis, so it's done in a doctor's office, and it helps. It's useful. It, it will reduce peripheral eosinophil counts, as to be expected, and it helps more if your eosinophil counts are out of whack. 
and uh, your FEV1 will possibly improve, likely improve, exacerbation rate drops by about half. Oral steroid dose in people who are steroid dependent, it cuts that by three quarters, which is pretty good. And I'm not sure that's really unique. So if you're not bored out of your mind yet, uh, we will talk about the fifth and final of these biologic drugs, uh, dipilumab, uh, which is dexapent. And this is a this is a drug that first came out a few years ago and got used quite a bit by dermatologists because it is FDA approved for eczema. And I haven't cornered my dermatology buddies on this, but I've seen, you know, we share patients in dermatology uh, and allergy sometimes. And I will tell you, out of the park home run. You see these lizard children who are just flipping miserable. And every day the mommies are slathering these kids, not just with moisturizer, which is a cornerstone, but steroids. And you cover a little guy with enough of this stuff. He's gonna soak some of it up. It's not all great. And this has been pretty magic. Uh, 37 grand a year to take this stuff. And unlike, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So that's how it works. And it blocks the receptor for interleukin-4, the alpha subunit, which is shared by the interleukin-13 receptor. That's more than you needed to know. So this is a humanized uh, thing against the IL-4 receptor and gets the IL-13. And this one is approved for the 12 and up crowd. Uh, it is, uh, uh, again, going to require pretty significant eosinophilia to be helpful. And uh, uh, at least 150, I'm a little more interested if the eosinophil counts 300. So there's a little cartoon demonstrating the uh, alpha subunit of interleukin-4, and there are two types of IL-4 uh, uh, receptors, and the interleukin-4, uh, or rather the interleukin-4 alpha uh, uh, receptor is part of the interleukin-13 receptor. So uh, that said, uh, we've got uh, data on its, come on, computer, uh, side effects. And it's pretty well tolerated. This is one you do yourself at home. So that's a selling point. Uh, you can sometimes see, oddly, a bump in eosinophils before, uh, you know, when you first get started with it. People will sometimes feel kind of achy and crappy with it. That has not been much of my experience, but none of us have extensive experience. These drugs are all, except for the, uh, the, the uh, Zolaire stuff, these drugs are all recent in the past couple of years. And I said it started off as an atopic dermatitis drug. It is now an asthma drug. So to dose it, it's 400 milligrams. Uh, for the first dose, then 200. That's the asthma dose. The eczema dose is higher. So we'll use 600 milligrams to start with, then drop to 300 uh, every other week. Again, every other week, not every month like the other guys. And uh, uh, a little more for the, uh, the eczema people. So if I've got an asthmatic who happens to have eczema, this is an obvious thing to be thinking about. So it's kind of weird because sometimes I've had asthma and I couldn't get the insurance company to agree with it for that, but they would for the eczema. So who knows? Uh, they, they aren't very clever. Uh, again, now immortalized in perpetuity that I said insurance companies aren't very clever, but I'm prepared to stand by that. Uh, so 50% uh, uh, reduction in exacerbations, uh, a little improvement in FEV1, uh, and uh, efficacy, again, hugely dependent on the eosinophil count. Uh, still helpful below 150, but I wanted to show you this. So there's the 200 milligram every other week dose. There's the 300 milligram every other week dose uh, for people who have these lower eosinophil counts. So not loving this if your eosinophil count is 200. Uh, and you can see, you know, it's a helpful drug. Uh, and here is data on the FEV1 improvement. And I don't know about you, I can't tell any darn difference between 200 and 300. So that's why the FDA seems to think for asthma, 200 milligrams every other week probably ought to be what you do. It's approved for atopic dermatitis and you can see bam, the atopic dermatitis just gets tons better. And uh, uh, we're looking at uh, weak, the, the two different blue lines here. Uh, uh, every other week, every week, didn't make any difference. And so every other week, please. Uh, and uh, so in summary on the biologics, then we'll move on and I'll rant about stuff about which uh, I think has more relevance in your day-to-day -day practice. Uh, they're all stupid expensive. Read that between, say, 15, maybe 20 grand uh, at a minimum, maybe 40 grand. And, you know, I blink and the price of stuff goes up. So I'm telling people, yeah, this will cost you about $180. 
no, it's actually $220 now. And so I tell the next guy, it's $220. No, it's $260 now. I'm not talking about a specific drug, but like all of them. Uh, you will need prior authorization. We have a nurse spending four hours a week uh, doing these authorizations, and I have it on good authority that that is not enough. And we are not big users of this. There are practices that have like everybody on these biologics, and Ed and John and I have plenty on them, but not armies on them. And so anyway, it's pretty obnoxious. She's on hold, like she spends her life on hold. Um, this is, the, all these drugs, all five of these drugs are not supposed to be in primary care settings. I wouldn't tell anybody if you had felt ambitious enough to use it, but we're happy to help. So what else have I got for you on that? Uh, they're all given in the office except the, uh, the Dupixent, and uh, uh, we use the Zoller for hives and the Dupixent for atopic dermatitis. So I think uh, that, and they all seem to really depend on those eosinophils as a function of efficacy. So I'm done on biologics. Uh, I would take any questions on them. I'll answer questions at the end if I'm left with any time. So this next uh, section I'm calling, what's wrong with this picture? There are some things that I'm like, ooh, I wish that hadn't happened this way. Of course, I'm referring to the Starbucks cup in uh, uh, Game of Thrones, right? You all saw that. It's been all over the news. So uh, it's, it's great. I don't like that kind of that genre. doesn't work for me, but the show works for me. So, and uh, now HBO will give me $50. Um, no, they're not really giving me $50. Uh, uh, albuterol HFA. We're talking about albuterol now. We're going to talk about bronchodilators. And uh, you have three original drugs to pick from, uh, Prevental, Ventolin, and Proair. Uh, they've now all got counters, which is important. And they're all a coin toss. So how many times have I heard a patient tell me, I like the red one, not the blue one, or I like the blue one, not the yellow one, or whatever, and there really is no reason why that ought to be the case. Same drug, same dose, uh, but now we have a new one. Now, a pet peeve, let's please all quit calling these rescue inhalers. I'm the only guy in the world, I think, that finds that term offensive. It intones to people that if you are dying of your asthma in emergency, break glass, use your albuterol. It is not that drug. If you're a little tight, for God's sakes, use your albuterol. It isn't that big a deal. And it's also kind of important because we use this as a barometer for how you're doing. Like, Bob, how you doing? Oh, I'm okay, Doc. Uh, how many times do you use your albuterol? I never use my albuterol. So you're never getting short of breath, tight in your chest. No, that happens every day. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of confusing to me. So there's a um, new one out there that I wanted to make you aware of, not because of efficacy. It's called Pro-Air Respiclic. I have a picture, and the reason why this is important, same drug, same dose. It's a dry powder inhaler. I generally prefer the puffers. The particles are smaller, and smaller is better. It gets deeper into your lungs. But the reason why I do use this a lot is it is preferred on many plans, including all the McFarland employees. So if I write for Ventolin, you're going to pay whatever, 40 bucks. If I write for Proair, you pay 10. And we have that lovely green checkmark red X thing on Epic. Take advantage of that. I mean, you know, even rich people don't like paying 40 when they could pay 10, right? So uh, that's what the Proair looks like. And it's different because it doesn't have a button on the top you press down on. You activate the device by lowering this cap and you suck it out. That's what the old Pro Air looks like and it's fine. They're all fine. They're all the same thing. Uh, but, you know, rather pay 10 if that's my, you know, if that's what I got. Uh, so there's another one out there called Lev Albuterol. Now, just like we were talking about earlier with Zizol, uh, uh, Zopinex is the left-handed isomer of albuterol. So why would you do that? Well, the right-handed isomer is the one that makes you shaky. So if that really bugs a guy and he's going to rather wheeze and cough than, you know, and, and be tight in his chest than shaky, you got him on the wrong inhaler. Only under that circumstance do you want to use the Zopinex because it's quite a bit more expensive. So it doesn't work better, it's just more expensive. The people that sold it would shamelessly go around telling people it worked better, and there really was never persuasive data to that effect. So do with that what you will. Uh, next, pet peeve, palpitation, shakiness, that kind of stuff, insomnia. Uh, so I've had some of the mommies who had to pay a fortune for their Zopinex, and they'd use that one if the kid needed something at bedtime because they wanted the little tyke to go to sleep because they'd had a long day. And so in that setting, it might make sense to pay extra. 
Uh, so next pet peeve, I think I'm on to the next pet peeve, uh, nebulizers. Okay, so look, I get it. 2,500 micrograms of albuterol, who would have guessed, is more effective than 180, which is two puffs of the 90 microgram puffer, right? But here's some good news. It's not really much better, if it's better at all. I've got a study I'm about to show you, which would argue that it's no better. But to the extent that it is better, you don't need 30 puffs of the puffer to get to an equivalency of the nebulizer, even though that's the way the math would have you believe, because again, the puffers have smaller particles. So probably, and, and when I have a question that I don't know the answer to, I of course go to Dr. Nassif. Probably not a brilliant thing for me to tell you. I really appreciate the referrals. Uh, uh, but having said that, uh, like Ed, how many puffs equals one NEB treatment? Ed told me six or eight. Uh, I think Wheeler thought four to six. It's in that neighborhood. So, you know, the nebulizer is a pain in the butt. It takes time. And then you got to clean the stupid thing. And uh, it, it uh, it's more expensive. And you need to have an outlet unless you have a battery-powered one. And our patients like it, uh, but I think... You know, one of my pet peeves, it's really important that people think we know what we're doing. And, you know, when I'm seeing Bob with his asthma and, you know, I'm doing my best to talk Bob into doing what I think he needs to do. And then, you know, somebody hauls off and gives him a nebula. It's like, oh, my God, that stuff's great. You know, it's a huge dose of albuterol. You know, it kind of makes me look bad. Not that that's that important, but I've slowed him down, and I don't really think he needed it. He could have just taken four or six puffs of his albuterol. And an important point, if the dude needs four or six puffs of his albuterol, what I'm doing to control his asthma probably ain't good enough as a rule. So you've kind of deprived me of an opportunity to see if we're kind of in the right domain with his asthma. So uh, it costs quite a bit more. And uh, this is a study, and I don't expect you to read it, but I did want to just throw up a slide from the journal Pediatrics that it didn't make any difference in the ER whether they got two puffs or uh, a NEB treatment. It probably really does. These were kids that were not wicked asthmatics, and so do with that what you will. Okay, I think this is maybe my last pet peeve, anticholinergic drugs. And there are five of them on the market now, but only two of them approved for asthma. Teotropium, which is Spireva, has been approved for asthma a few years back. Ipotropium, which is what you find in Atrovent, also sold in combination with Albuterol in the form of Combavent, is it's an okay drug. It works a little better. So in the emergency room, I'm totally fine with an ER doc giving my nine-year-old kid, uh, I don't have a nine-year-old kid, uh, my nine-year-old patient, uh, a, uh, a dose of Duonab. Or if you've got somebody all of a sudden abruptly sick with asthma and you gave them up, your all didn't work, go ahead and knock yourself out. Use some Duonab. But this is not a good choice for routine maintenance, partly because it doesn't really work much better, but partly because it may not be so awesome for you. So I stole all of what I'm about to show you from up to date. So this is not like Jay Brown is making stuff up. Uh, we have some reason to be concerned about this. Uplift uh, trial compared Spireva versus ipotropium bromide. And people die more with ipotropium bromide in that trial. A subsequent trial found that, well, maybe it's not a problem. Another subsequent meta-analysis found that there's a of 1.53 increased relative risk of an MI and a 1.8 relative risk of death with your Combavent slash Duoneb used all the time. So even in the COPDers, we have other options, and I think we should pursue them. So specifically, uh, uh, this thing that nobody uses, uh, this thing uh, that nobody uses, uh, this thing, uh, which a lot of us use, is Spireva, and it's a good product. It comes in a couple of versions, a dry powder capsule, which I don't like as much, is their Respimat deal, which you twist and click. You need an engineer to put the stupid thing together for you the first time. Pharmacists will walk your patients through it, but it is kind of a contraption. But it works really well. It's got a real fine mist. It looks like something coming out of a nebulizer. And uh, then there's Incruise, uh, which is the GSK product. Uh, of all of them, uh, the only ones FDA approved for asthma, of those Four, the only one approved by the FDA is the Spireva. Where did it go? Right there. So uh, ipotropium bromide is also approved for asthma, but for reasons I mentioned, I don't like it. Oh, no, I'm not done. So uh, anybody know what that molecule is? Shout it out. Anybody? Alexander Fleming, 
1928, came back from Scotland and had all these bacterial cultures growing in his messy lab that he neglected all summer while vacationing in Scotland. And there were a bunch of dead bacteria around one of the colonies of mold that was growing on a Petri dish. He thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe we can use that to, di to, distinct, uh, to make a distinction between this kind of bacteria and that kind of bacteria. So for a few years, they thought this might be useful in differentiating bacteria. And then somebody had the clever idea, well, I think one of his people had the clever idea of going, oh, geez, maybe we could kill bacteria with this stuff. It is penicillin. So a few quick rants on penicillin. And the reason I'm getting into this is because we like treating people's penicillin allergy, or at least testing people's penicillin allergy. But every time you send us one of those people, we lose money. And it's not all about that. But I got a phone call the other day from a friend of mine, an allergist in the Quad Cities. I'd sent him a patient. Lady was a veterinarian student, and now she's a veterinarian in the Quad Cities. And she has asthma. And I sent him a note. And he called me up. He said, Jay, you tested her for penicillin. Why did you do that? I said, well, because she was allergic to penicillin. He's like, you dummy. Uh, you can't do that. It's expensive. You lost money on that. I'm like, well, yes, I was trying to be helpful. And I still want to be helpful. Uh, I got a letter from a colleague in uh, Cedar Falls who sent me a note. I'm one of his referring doctors when a kid leaves Iowa State to go to UNI or something. I like this uh, Dr. Redfern dude, and I, he's retired now, so not really a, a public service announcement for him. But he sent me a letter saying, we're no longer doing penicillin testing. And I got to tell you, uh, we want to be helpful, but don't send me somebody just because they had a penicillin allergy. The kind of patients we're looking for are the ones that have a, a need for something. You know, they, they've got a bad heart valve or they've got 18 million other drug allergies. We will help you. We will not close off that option for people. But just because a kid reacted to it, it's just not practical. It's not feasible to be doing tons and tons of penicillin allergy testing. So uh, there are a bunch of different kinds of penicillin, and I'm running you through that, but it doesn't really matter. And uh, But I got one more slide for you. This, I think, is my ultimate slide. Uh, yeah, epidemiology. So temper a lot of people tons of people who say they're allergic. They're not really allergic. They're not lying to you. But what they had was a viral exanthem, or maybe they did have a penicillin allergy. They don't anymore. Uh, and we definitely see more allergy in the penicillin, uh, more penicillin allergy in the people who are atopic. So the asthmatics and the hay fever people do more of this. So uh, there are a lot of kinds of penicillin allergy. We're testing for IgE-mediated stuff, but for sure don't send us the kid that had terrible joint pains or bruising or their skin fell off because this is much more complicated and much more dangerous potentially, uh, and our testing will be negative, but you'll still hurt them if you give them penicillin. So, you know, if they had hemolytic anemia or they had bruising at the sides of their welts, uh, we don't want to see them. Uh, we'll send them home without doing the testing because it's not, it's, it's not safe. So uh, uh, when you take your penicillin history, find out what they got, when they got it, when they got the rash, and uh, we'll uh, be happy to see those people who really have to have it. There are three circumstances in medicine where that is the only drug, and I don't know any ID people. Dr. Well, we only have one now, Dr. Fulton. I don't see what there. Um, neurosyphilis, uh, penicillin, got to use it. Uh, enterococcus in the urine of the pregnant lady, penicillin, got to use it. And I put myself to the test here. Uh, neurosyphilis, enterococcus. Oh, neuro, uh, yeah, uh, I'm missing one. Listeria meningitis. Uh, we will cheerfully see the armies of people you all see with Listeria meningitis who have a penicillin allergy. And we'll do it at 2 in the morning if you need us to. So uh, I think that's the whole show. Uh, I would cheerfully take any questions. Yeah, I think that'll do it. So th these are the people we want to, you know, probably not see. Oh, incidentally, if they reacted to penicillin on mono, uh, you probably shouldn't have given them penicillin for their mono because, uh, like, huge percentages, uh, upwards of 90% in some series, will get an allergic reaction to it. So I think I'm done. Questions? Yes, Dr. Salty. Yeah, you know, I, I've warmed up to it more for emphysema. And it's a bit of a desperation drug still for me. But, you know, I attended a talk where the pediatrician was saying, don't give the toddler with an asthma exacerbation prednisone or prelone, give them Zithromax. And all of us were like, well, that's really weird. And that's not the standard of care now. But 
I think the, you know, the jury's out on that. These, these macrolide antibiotics have actually fairly significant anti-inflammatory effects on the lungs. So some of their benefit may derive from their antibacterial effect. And I'm a poor man's pulmonologist since we're so short-staffed in pulmonary right now. And in Marshalltown, I'm kind of like, you know, one of your choices. And so I had a lady coughing up green stuff, and, you know, she's on maxed out on 18 drugs, and I put her on that, and I'm her hero. So, uh, I mean, that's an end of one, but it, it is increasingly appreciated that that stuff, for reasons I'm not at all prepared to fully explain, just kind of sweep the dirt under the rug. Well, it's anti-inflammatory, but you'll have to settle for that. Good question. Uh, any others? Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have a question. Yes, please. Right. You know, I'm just old school enough to be a little edgy about that. So, you know, the bronchodilators, I didn't mention, but if you douse people with bronchodilators, you will actually increase bronchial hyperreactivity. And they invented some, what was the name of that stuff? There was just this wicked, powerful bronchodilator that was introduced in New Zealand and Australia, and the death rate from asthma skyrocketed. So it looks like a lot of that uh, increased bronchial hyperactivity, which is a bad thing, is mitigated by the concomitant use of a steroid, a topical steroid. But uh, I'm still, you know, package insert four puffs a day of the Symbicort. But the people who are telling you that didn't make it up. And I will tell you the English and the Europeans, for that matter, have been dabbling with a thing that's a radically different than what we do on this side of the pond approach, where they're handing people drugs with Fomoterol, which is a rapid-acting but also long-acting bronchodilator coupled with a steroid. So they've done Fomoterol plus Beclomethasone, which is what's in QVAR, not so much Symbicor, which is a different steroid. But what they say to the people is, okay, you've got asthma, use this when you want to. And they use that Symbicor, except it's not Symbicor, as needed. There, there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine on this, and oddly, the North American approach, which is a little more paternalistic. Hey, do this. That's what I'm telling you. And not like, hey, if you feel crappy, do this. If you feel better, don't do anything. You know, you kind of figure it out. But that kind of you figure it out approach with Symbicort, or actually it was Beclomethasone plus uh, Fomoterol, it actually did not lead to more missed days work, more lost night sleep, lower lung functions, more ER. I mean, it was kind of comparable. And so, you know, stay tuned, but I think very few of us in the asthma domain, you know, the specialty domain, are, are doing that. But, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm guessing that the professor who announced that from the podium sees patients a half a day a week. So, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, I mean, it's a thing. And, you know, the, the truth is, a lot of the patients we say here do this all the time, they come back and follow up and say they're doing it all the time. And you call the pharmacy, like, how many has Bob refilled? One in a year, you know? I mean, so I think this is actually happening in the real world, whether we like it or know it. Uh, but uh, that's not Gina yet. In fact, if I went back to the Gina slide, there is kind of a carve out on one of those two Gina guideline slides where it does acknowledge that as an option. Long-acting bronchodilator plus steroid used weirdly on a PRN basis. So, you know, they didn't make that up. Jay, good, good question. Yeah, Jay, and your anaphylaxis in your biologics, is it at all related to the level of IgE, particularly in Zolar? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't know that anybody has their mind around the mechanism of that. Uh, and it's not just Zoller. The anti-IL-5s, I mean, you can be allergic to virtually anything you put in a body, but uh, it looks like this is not an actually IgE binding your drug allergy. It's like the drug itself is somehow fomenting an allergic reaction. At least that's my conceptualization of it. But I, I, we don't understand the mechanism, and I, that's a good question if it's related to your IgE level. Uh, as near as I know, the reason why uh, the company didn't authorize the use of this drug for people with higher IgE levels is that they thought they'd make, and again, totally confabulating answers here, but I thought they thought they'd make more money, you know, because if you're going to dose uh, the guy whose IgE level is 1,500 
and charge him 40 grand a year, then how are you supposed to get 40 grand out of the guy who needs a tenth as much? You know what I mean? Like, so call me a cynic, but I think that may have had something to do with the, the, the logic behind the restriction on IgE total dose or total level in deciding who is allowed to use the stuff. So that's a good question. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. We need to ask Ed. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming.